Yeah. 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 Okay, so so here we go. Here we go. Okay, so I want to look at absolute value stuff. Now this is gonna be a really helpful section to you though, and here's why. Because what we're gonna do with this, we're gonna primarily we're gonna talk about absolute value functions and we're gonna look at the graphs of absolute value functions mainly. So you're gonna be doing mainly two things. Given an absolute value function, you're gonna either either make a graph of the absolute value function, given the function, or the opposite process. I'm gonna give you a graph. Okay, I don't wanna hear anybody talking right now. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a graph and you're gonna write the absolute value function that goes with it. Okay, and then evaluating absolute value functions is no big deal. That, that's, and then I'm gonna show you also one little calculator trick that goes with this at the end. It doesn't really, there's just an excuse to show it to you is this section, but it could come from any section. All right, so absolute value functions. We know what they are, right? We know what they do. What is the absolute value of negative seven? Seven. The absolute value of seven is? No. Seven, right? Absolute value functions, their job is to make sure that the output is positive. If the input is positive, they don't do anything, right? If the input is negative, well, they'll make it positive by multiplying by a negative, right? Multiplying by negative one. So this is really just a piecewise function, isn't it? Right? And let me do this. Line shouldn't be there. You get the idea. Mrs. Buck. I know. I know. I know. I'm not very talented with this. You're so important to this thing. I feel like you're on. Um, I feel like your calibration is really correct. That's not, really not really good. Good. Anyway, so enough of that. You get the idea. Okay, so look at this piecewise function. What's it saying? When x is positive, this top piece is, is where x is positive. The function that is switched on is absolute value of x equals x equals itself. Makes sense, right? If the number is already positive inside the absolute value bars, the answer is just that number. It's just x, right? Now, on the other hand, if x is less than 0, if x is negative, we've got to make it positive by multiplying it by negative 1. And then the in-between case, if x is 0, well, what's the absolute value of 0? Zero? 0. 0. So that's our output for that one little point. Okay, so now let's move on and let's look at, we kind of know how they behave. Let's look at what their graphs look like. Absolute value functions are always V-shaped. So they're gonna have that basic look to them. Now we can tweak that V, we can make it, we can stretch it vertically so it's kind of tall and skinny or we can squash it vertically so it spreads it out. Uh, we can flip it over so it opens down instead of up. We can do all kinds of things to them, but they're always essentially this V shape, right? Uh, they consist of this vertex. We call that point the vertex right there. And then these two rays that just extend off forever, okay? So the left line is just this. In this case, it's, it's the left leg of the absolute value function, the left leg of the V. In this case, it's just the line y equals negative x. And in this case, is y equals x. If we're just looking at the plain old vanilla y equals absolute value of x function. But we can change that. We can change that. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, and then we call this point the vertex. Notice, this is important. Notice that an absolute value function whoops, has symmetry, folding symmetry, doesn't it? Symmetry is a, is a really big deal in math. We always want to try to take advantage of symmetry because it allows us to make things easier without having to do lots of work. Notice that this one has symmetry about, about a vertical line drawn through its vertex. Thank you, sir. Let's see, Samantha, I saw, and is Tony here? Oh, there's Tony. Okay. Let's do that to Tony. Okay, so we call this the axis of symmetry. And it's just the, the vertical line drawn through the, through the vertex. And we have folding symmetry about that. What that means, remember, is if I draw one half of this, like in wet ink, and then I fold the page along the axis, it'll make the imprint. The ink will just make the imprint of the other leg, right, for free. Okay? So what we want to do then is we want to, our goal is we want to be able to tweak that, that really plain absolute value function to do all the stuff I described earlier. 
Here's how we do it. There are going to be three parameters, three numbers that we can dial in for an absolute value function that will accomplish anything we want to. It will change it in any conceivable way. It make it any kind of B you could possibly imagine. Here's what they do. Now, first of all, these numbers up here that we're going to be plugging into this called the vertex form. Okay, this is vertex form for an absolute value function. The vertex is always going to be located at the point HK. So whatever numbers you have for H and K, those represent the coordinates of that point that's the vertex, okay, kind of the starting point of the V. It's V-shaped, and the value of A determines a lot. If A is a number that's less than zero, so if it's negative, it means that the V opens down. If it's positive, it means that the V opens up. Now, we know it's wider if A is a smaller number, and it's going to be narrower if A is a bigger number. Okay, But there's a better way to think about that. The way you really want to think about A, this is the best way to do it. A is the slope of the right leg of the V. And then the left leg is just going to be the mirror image of that, right? So let's look at an example of how we could take something like this and, and, and make a graph from it. Okay? So we can always start with the vertex. That's our starting point. We're going to identify what the vertex is, and we'll plot the vertex. And then we'll just draw the right leg by using the value of A as its slope and reflect it over to get the left leg. Okay? So for example, let's look at this one here. Now, we're going to compare this to the vertex form. I guess I should have erased that. We're going to compare this to our vertex form and determine what the values of those parameters are. OK, let's start easy. What's the value of A? OK, does that make sense? In other words, that's the number that I would substitute in for A to get that result, right? So A is negative 1. Now, here's the part that can be a little tricky. Uh, K is simple. What's K? 3. 3. Okay, K is just 3. That's the number that's being added to the end. But what is H? H is tricky. What's H? No, it's not. Leah, what do you think? Negative. It's negative 2, right. How come? Because it would, in the split, it would be the 2 and you add the negative. OK. Now, you, you have the right answer, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that explanation just a little bit. Yeah, here's that. Yes, ma'am. Because it has double negative. OK, good. There, OK, good. H is the number that's being subtracted from x always. OK, now this might seem strange, but this is probably ringing a bell. Remember when we did that transformation stuff that some of you guys are still kind of wrapping up? Remember I told you that the absolute value stuff was going to make that a lot easier to visualize and see? It will, because this is how we do with every function that we deal with. We're starting with an absolute value function because it's so easy. But pretty soon, we'll move on into parabolas, which are U-shaped graphs. Those are going to have a vertex also. We're going to, we're going to move on to uh, some radical functions and look at like uh, cube roots and square roots. And those also have a value of H and K. And they're all treated the same. The value of the vertex or the starting point or the special point, whatever that might be. It doesn't have to necessarily be a vertex, but the value of the special point in a function always has coordinates h, k, and it's always written in this kind of a way. h is the number that's being subtracted from the independent variable x, and k is just the number that's being added to the whole thing at the end, right? And so how do we recognize then? There's a couple kind of there's a couple ways that you can you can some rules of thumb that'll make this a little bit easier. So let me get everybody's eyes up here. I'm not, I want to see everybody tracking me and watching this stuff here. Okay, so I know then that something that's always going to happen when I'm dealing with a vertex form of a function is whatever the, the operation is between x and the number, the sine of h is always the opposite of that operation, isn't it? Right? So that's kind of my easy rule of thumb. If, if a number is being added to x, then I know that the sine of h is going to be negative and vice versa because of that double negative thing. If if h is the number being subtracted from x, what happens if we subtract a negative? Plus. Plus, right? So that's how we get a plus there is by subtracting a negative. That's the one that you've got to be really careful with. The other ones are, are really obvious, but h is the one that's a little bit tricky. Okay, so now think about this. 
Now I've got my, I've got all my parameters there. I know those are the numbers, right? And I'm dialing in. Just like, for example, if I were going to specify a line in the xy plane, all I've got to do is dial in two numbers to make any line I could possibly in the whole universe. I just have to dial in the slope and the y-intercept, right? And by dialing in two specific numbers, I can pin down any line I want to. For an absolute value function, it's a little more complicated than a line, and so it takes three numbers instead of two, right? But now that I've got these numbers chosen, I've got them dialed in, what is that going to look like in terms of a graph? Okay, well, first of all, we know that the vertex is at negative 2, 3, don't we? Right? Because the values of h and k are negative 2 and 3. And we know that those are the x and y coordinates of the vertex in alphabetical order. x before y, h before k. Right? So we know that. We know the vertex. And so if I go to a graph, I can put a point there. I know that if I go to negative 2, positive 3, that's the vertex of my function. That's where the point of the v is going to be. Now i got to go remember what a is. Well, a is negative 1. That's the slope of the right side, isn't it? So I'm going to drop by, if I make a slope triangle, I'm just going to rise by negative 1 and run by positive 1. Remember, we always calculate slopes from left to right on the xy plane. Okay, so I make this point. Now, all I have to do to create the right leg, then, of this v is just start at the vertex and connect and extend, right? I'm just going to make a ray out of that. Oh, and then they're telling you to make the other point first. That's fine. I don't care if you do or not. Uh, to make the other point on the other side, I'm, create, I'm using A to create the point that forms the right leg of the V. Because we've got that symmetry, I can just reflect that over the axis of symmetry to get the left point, right? And now I just connect and extend to make rays. Make sense? Pretty, it's really not bad, is it? That's all you do to make an absolute value function. They're pretty simple. Let's try another one. What's A here? Good. What's H? Positive 1. Good. It's the number being subtracted from X and K? 1. So the vertex is then going to be at the point H, K, 1, 1, right? The slope of the right-hand side is negative 1 again, so I drop by 1 and run by 1. And then I just extend, and I reflect it over to get the other one, right? No big deal. Okay. Let's work backwards. This time, I'm going to give you the graph, and you have to, now in math, we call this inspection. We're going to inspect the graph and determine what the values of A and H and K are, because that's going to tell us what the actual function is, what the equation is of the absolute value function, right? So by looking at this, first of all, what are the coordinates of the vertex? Zero, negative, three, right? So if we know that the vertex is at zero, negative, three, isn't that telling us H equals zero? K equals negative three, that's good, okay. Now, how are we going to get A? How'd you get that? Okay, so we're going to pick two convenient points and make a slope triangle, right? Yeah. There are two convenient points, so we're rising by 2, running by 1. So A equals 2 over 1, or 2, and we got it. All we have to do then is just fill in the blanks in vertex form. Okay, so what's my function going to be? Y equals 2, two times the absolute value of X minus 0. Now, what if I simplify that? What is x minus 0? Just x, right? So I'll just write that as the absolute value of x plus, which I would write as minus 3. Minus three. That's it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, and so this is, that's what we did, right? We found the vertex. We found a. And that's our answer, right? No big deal. Okay, what about this one? Let me try this real quick. I don't even care if you write it down. Just see, come up with, just see if you can come up with the values. You can make you do it in your head. So you want to find h and k coordinates of the vertex, right? 
got to find a slope. Okay, so what do you think? Quentin, where's the, what are the coordinates of the vertex? X equals what? Zero. Y equals three. Zero, three. Okay, so H is zero. K is three, right? Okay, what's the slope of the, basically, what's the slope of the right-hand side? This right-hand leg, what do we get for slope there? One over two, good. Do we see that? Start there, and there, I'm going up one over two. So I got A, got B, got H and K. That's my answer. One half is A, X minus zero is just X, plus three, right? Okay, here's the last thing I want to show you. That's it for this, but there's one other thing I want to show you, graphing calculator trick, and we're in great shape. I know this stuff looks a lot easier. <laughs> okay, so so get you need a graphing calculator for this. Everybody get a graphing calculator. Uh, just here, I, you can borrow. I'll put these up here, and you can borrow one if you, if you need one. That's fine. Yeah. She has her own tablet too. Okay, so so here we go. Here we go. Take a look at this. Now, this is the kind of question. This is the kind of question I want to introduce you to. And, and this is something. There's a way you can do this with a graphing calculator that's really tricky. So everybody, everybody, make sure I want to get everybody's full attention here because this is one that people have lost trouble with if they don't follow this step by step. Now, this is different than the kinds of questions that you've been asked in the past. Typically, you've been asked questions like, what's the value of y when x equals something? Okay, That's easy to do on a calculator. That's where we just do that trace trick, right? Where we go, we graph it, and we go trace and type in the x value, or we can go second calc value. All we're doing is just plugging in an x value and calculating the simplified value of y, right? This is different. This time you're being asked to, given the y value, so the value of the function, not x, you're asked to solve for the values of x that make that true. Now, this there is no direct shortcut on a calculator to do this, but there's a trick. You can trick the calculator into giving you the answer, and this is a really valuable skill to have. So here's what you do. First of all, let's, let's graph this absolute value function, which is going to be a little strange. You haven't done that yet, so I'm going to show you how to. So I'm going to clear all this stuff out. Okay, so to get the absolute value function, there's a couple ways you can do this to find it on the calculator. The easiest way, I think, is to go to the math menu or the math screen. And the math screen has a whole bunch of menus. You know, it's got a math menu that has some math functions. It's got some numerical stuff. Uh, it's got some complex variable stuff, some probabilities, all kinds of different menus. The one we want is the numerical menu. So you'd go math. Number, it's the first one. ABS is absolute value. So then I would just hit enter. So math, number, enter. Gets you to absolute value. There's another way to do it too. So let's, I'm going to clear that one. Here's another way you can always do it. If you go to what's called the catalog, a catalog on the calculator is exactly what you might expect. It's just a list of all of the things the calculator can do, all of the apps and functions and all that stuff. And so what do you think is alphabetically the very first one? Absolute value. So if I just go second catalog, it's the first option. So I can just hit enter and choose the first one. And notice what it does here. Now, 
If you've got an 84 with the new operating system, which if you have an 84, you should have. If you don't, I need to, you know, to update your operating system. When I, when I choose absolute value, look what it does. It actually puts in a set of absolute value bars. So it looks like an absolute value function. Now, if you're using uh, a TI-83, it, it's not gonna, it's just gonna look like ABS with parentheses, and that's okay. It just means that whatever goes in the absolute value bars, you would enclose in the parentheses, right? But this is kind of nice because it actually looks like what it means. So I want to do, now I don't want to do that yet though, do I? I wanted to do a negative two thirds times the absolute value. Mm -hmm. So I can even make this look really good with my, with my fraction bar. I could go negative, and then how do I get to the fraction template? Alpha F1, good. Alpha F1, and then enter just puts me into fraction template. Okay. F1, the buttons on the top are the function button. F1 through F5. Mm -hmm. So alpha F1, enter, gives you the fraction template. I'm going to put a 2 on the top, hit the down arrow, put a 3 on the bottom, and then hit the right arrow to get out of the fraction. Right, so I got negative 2 thirds X. Whoops, I don't want X, sorry. I want absolute value. <laughs> Messed up. So I'll just go second catalog, enter, to get my absolute value bars. Or math number, oh, enter. It turns it off. Okay, and then I'm gonna in there I'm gonna put in x. Remember, I have to use the variable x. I can't use the the alpha x. I have to use the variable button. So x plus three. Now, how do I get out of the absolute value bars? Right arrow. right arrow gets me out of the absolute value bars, and then plus four, right? Okay, now watch what happens. If I go zoom six, zoom standard. <coughs> Look at that. Okay. It makes, there's my absolute value function. Upside down because A was negative, right? Okay, but now how do I do this part where Y equals negative 3? There is no, if I go up here to second calculate, and you don't have to do that, none of these options are going to work for this problem. Okay, none of them work. So I got to do something different. Here's the trick. If I go up to Y equals, I'm going to add a new function that's just going to be a horizontal line at negative 3. So whatever the y value is that you're, that, that you're using in this problem, I want to find out where the function has a certain y value. I just graph that horizontal line. So y2 equals negative 3. Now watch what happens if I hit graph. It graphs that horizontal line. So what do you suppose I'm looking for here? If I want to find the x values where y is negative 3. Exactly. I'm looking for the intersections, aren't I? Right? So now, the deal on the calculator, though, is for it to tell you the intersections, you have to be able to see them. Problem here is what? I can see there's an intersection there, but do you anticipate another intersection? Yeah. yeah. If I were to continue off the screen, isn't there going to be another one over here somewhere? Okay, so I need to see that one. So how am I going to change the window to see that other intersection? Yeah, you've got to go to window, which is the one that I want to I want to tweak. X minimum, right? I want the minimum, the small x value that's the left edge of the screen. I want that to be something further to the left than negative ten. So give me a, give me a number. Negative twenty. Let's try that. Negative twenty. If it's not right, that's okay. We'll just try again. Now, whenever I change the x values, what do I want to do with the the zoom. Actually, I don't even really have to. Read it. right. I could hit zoom. If I hit zoom fit, it'll redraw it for me. But if I just hit graph, that'll work too. Because all it's doing is just stretching the screen out that way. That's okay, right? I could have hit zoom zero and it would have made it a little prettier, but this is okay. Because I can see both intersections, right? So how do I find the intersections? Okay, to find an intersection, that's, that's, a, that's a question for the graph, isn't it? If ever I have a question for the graph, I go second calc, second F4. So second calculations menu. Which one do you suppose I want? Intersect. So I'm going to choose number five. Now it's going to ask me three questions, right? And I don't know if you've seen this before. I can't remember if we've seen this or not yet. Lose track. I do this in so many different classes. Uh, it first wants to know what are the two curves, and it's just calling, the calculator is calling anything that's being graphed a curve. That's kind of a math word. Even though these don't look like curves, that's what we call them. 
Because they, so in most cases, they are, they, they do kind of curve instead of just go straight. So what about this, the first curve? Is it y1? Yeah, it is, right? It's y1 and y2 are the two things that I want to intersect, correct? So y1 is one of them, so I hit enter. Is the second curve y2? Yes, it is, so I hit enter. And any time I've just got two things graphed, I know I'm just going to hit enter twice, so I can just go enter, enter. But the third question is an important one. It's prompting me, see the question mark, it's asking me a question. It's prompting me to make a guess. If I don't move the cursor close to one of these intersections, it might find the wrong one. So I've got to trace it. I can, I can type in a value of x, but it's probably quicker just to trace. And this one up here doesn't work very well, but if you just hold down the left button, it'll just kind of scroll over there where you want it to be. So I'm going to find the left one first. I'll just stop about, that's probably close enough. If I hit enter, it'll zero in on the exact intersection. Look, it gives me the coordinates. The coordinates of that intersection are x equals negative 13.5, y equals negative 3. Okay, so that's one. I'm looking for the x values, aren't I? Right, so that's one of them. One solution is x equals negative 13.5, right? What about the other one? What am I going to do to find the other one? Any suggestions? Same thing. I'm going to go second, calculations, five, and then I can just hit enter, enter. Now i got to make a guess. So where's my guess going to be? Well, over there, right? Now, I know that isn't my x max positive 10? So I could trace over there. But I could also say, OK, if that's positive 10, 7 seems reasonable, something like that, wouldn't you say? So if I just type in a 7 and hit Enter, it'll move over there close to 7 and find the exact answer, which is 7.5. OK, make sense? So I got the other answer, x equals positive 7.5. Now, what Moodle's going to ask you to do is it's going to say, if there are multiple values, and in this case there are, just separate them with a comma. So I would just write that. Doesn't, order doesn't matter. I would just say 13.5 comma, whoops, negative 13.5 comma 7.5, and that would be the correct answer. Oh, wow. Okay, how about that? Make sense? Yep. Yeah. All right, you guys are set. You got 332. Yeah, we can go 332. That's fine. You know why I really like that lot?